the artists are right on the edge, and they're and they're 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 expanding the landscape. They're 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 moving the culture forward. They're moving the culture forward in the unknown, and they do that by translating what is as of yet unimaginable, but sense into what is at least imaginable and representing not, representing not the image of Thank <laughs> you. 
it's a real piece of art because you'll also give one little introduction to the artist and then that'll seep into your life and that'll change things like now. But it's really, it's unbelievably worth it because it, it opens your eyes to the domain of the transcendent. That's the right way of thinking about it. A real piece of art is a window into the transcendent. That's what it is. And you need that in your life because you're finite and limited and bounded right, by your ignorance and your lack of knowing. And unless you can make a connection to the transcendent, then you don't have the strength to prevail. And that's part of the covenant. That's part of the covenant up and on. on, on, on. Whatever is uncovered by the empirical science, being the science is being is this, uh, being is non-existent. Whatever we've tried to fill in the blank with, we have not yet reached closure. That's why I said that philosophy is a funny endeavor. It has a 2,500-year history of failure, and yet it continues. So obviously, it's not quite in the spirit of capitalism to be taking this enterprise. It's a long time to run a doing business. 2,500. This won't, this won't be, this blank can't be filled in. Be it is, can't be filled in. The blank won't be filled, can't be filled in. Why not? I mean, we want an argument. We don't want this. I mean, the first thing is that we've noticed that no one's ever successfully filled it. That's the first thing we notice. That, you know, the history of philosophy has not yet presented us with final wisdom, total coverage, and ultimate truth. We know that, so that's step one, is to know that. See, philosophy is not like building a house where you start with a firm foundation and build it up and you're finished and you walk off and that's philosophy. Philosophy under the heading of deconstruction is housework, which means every day the floor is to be swept again, the dishes have to be done again, and I'll be damned, the next day it's just like that again, and it's just like that again, and it's just like that again. So deconstruction, if I wanted to compare it as a practice to some other practice, it would be housework. It doesn't get finished. And the equality of men and women becomes a universal social reality, so inevitable uh, that it seems uh, to be a mere fact of nature rather than a lofty ideal of some kind. The gradual transformation of subjectivities as they adapt or are reprogrammed new infrastructural realities is called cultural revolution. If we don't have enough hierarchies of confidence for everyone, then, then you know, it's not something the creator be able to produce some new one. Here, 
such as these pieces um, during some of the other talks over the last two days. Um, so yeah. Well, I threw, I threw an info for page to my notebook. Yeah, and that is one more comment of that, you've got it. And everything that Peterson uses, or rather misuses, has a problem. So people, his audience, have no clue. They don't have that depth of history. Yeah, that's true. Any other questions? What were some of the other voices? I think, I assume that was Peterson at the very end. Yeah, there was a lot of Peterson in there at the very beginning and the very end. Uh, the other voices were Rick Roderick, um, a professor that taught in, well, he was from West Texas. He taught a couple different places. He's passed now. Uh, those lectures are from the mid-90s or maybe the early 90s. Yeah. And I think it's telling how much they speak to uh, Peterson today. Like, you could almost pretend like he's directly replying to Peterson when he's explaining postmodernism. Right. Um, and then I used David Foster Wallace talking about his experience with seeing Blue Velvet in the movie theaters and changing his conception of postmodern or avant-garde art. Um, and I think that's a good clip just because of what he says as well as a postmodern artist. Uh, Wallace, um, but also there's some fun stuff to play there if you're going to give into Peterson and all, like some synchronicities with the lobster references, or because um, Foster's famous essay, Consider the Lobster. Mm -hmm. um, and then let's see, there was um, Klein, Kleinberg, I believe his name is, it's a philosopher, or um, a professor at Wesley University, I think. Um, He's a Derridian and a historian. Uh, and that was him talking about Derrida and the point and the line and the plane um, and their interconnectedness. And then Frederick Jameson, um, who is one of the popularizers of the term postmodernism, his book, uh, Postmodernism or the Logic of Late Capitalism, I believe it's called. Um, and, him, that, and those were clips from his talk uh, about Reimagining Utopia. He put out a book a few years ago. Um, yeah, yeah, about think about Utopia, write about it. It might be a personal thing. And that's kind of what I want to encourage artists to do, to do art with that in mind, um, knowing that you're not going to create the perfect system. And of course, it's not a political project. It has some politics to it, has some philosophy and sociology to it. but. I wouldn't say, hey, don't vote or don't join the DSA or don't organize it all. Just make art or write stories that thinks about how life could be different. But to combat the capitalist realism climate that we're in, I do think it's important and I think it could play a vital role in starting the imagination. And, um, and you know, like, so Zizek uh, recently said that how much he hated Utopia, even though he really endorsed Jameson's book. Um, <laughs> and uh, he said something like, we'll never build heaven on earth. Maybe socialism will be a slightly better hell. And if you believe that, OK, write me a dystopian novel or um, some comics that show me a different hell, that show a hell that isn't about labor exploitation right. um, and so on and so on. My idea of utopia has always been that uh, no matter how much better things get, you will be misunderstood, you will be betrayed, uh, you will suffer, you will die, uh, but you might be in prettier surroundings while it's happening. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> but, there, but it's not a cure-all. Right. And, and, and this notion of utopia is a cure. First of all, utopia, if utopia was really a cure-all, it would be so boring. Absolutely. You'd want to leave. Yeah. That, I, I completely agree with that. In Jameson's book as well, um, he kind of says that. He's like, look, we're not, I'm not creating, even though I'm calling this utopia, I'm calling it utopia because it's a different social right. order or trying to imagine a different social order. I'm not saying I'm creating an organic whole society. Um, he even goes so far as to say that there should be zones in cities or maybe whole cities where there are no laws, where people are allowed to murder and all sorts of stuff, if that's where they want to live. 
don't know if I would go that far. We're all conscripted into the military. Yeah, yeah, and we're all but conscripted into the military. Not necessarily to kill. It's not necessarily to kill, yeah. Yeah, um, I actually, I loved the book, and then watching his talk on it, I realized some of the problems I had with the book were actually supposed to be jokes, but the tone didn't come through, because when he's explaining some of them, he's laughing, like he's like, and uh, for the pacifists and conscientious objectors, we'll put them in charge of arms development, or something like that, and when I read the book, I was like, wait, what, why, why wouldn't, okay, that doesn't really, and then, in the talk, he's laughing for it. I'm like, oh, I get it. You're just being playful. Um, There's a yeah. lot of playfulness. In yeah, yeah. Actually. I really enjoyed uh, that book as well. Anything else? Cool. Oh, just one funny aside about James. I have a friend who uh, was a professor here at Boise State. She went to school with Jameson's daughter. Yeah. And. You know how you think of your parents? That's how James is. Well, I'm sure. It's, it's like, you know, I can't, everyone tells me how brilliant my dad is, and I know he is, but he'll, he'll read a couple articles in a book and then listen to some punk rock records, and then he'll write something that everyone says is the most seminal thing ever written on yeah. punk music. <laughs> <laughs> He's just bewildered with bits for a day. That's a trophy right. of a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> So once again, what I was saying, like, you will be misunderstood, you will be mis disrespected. Jameson is the proof here. Oh, absolutely. You still absolutely. can't convince your kids. <laughs> That's pretty funny. I know. Um, it's hilarious. Yeah, and so, oh, also, yeah, I just, um, like I said, this is a little bit messier, but I tend to use a lot of chaotic and stream of consciousness production when making art. Um, I do digital stuff as well, which is less uh, stream of consciousness just because of the way the medium works. I don't know, I just haven't found a way to do that. And I think that's important as well. Um, I don't think you can organize politics like that. You know, we're not gonna have a stream of consciousness law or anything like that. But, and I think that's something that Peterson um, kind of gets at that attracts people. The, tells them this, not only to self-authoring, but also to dive into their unconscious, however mm -hmm. he misrepresents um, subconscious, like what the unconscious is. Um, and so yeah, I think that's, that's good for leftists and for artists in general to kind of have a better, um, or even to have less expectation of perfection and mm -hmm. want to play with it um, and understand that error might be necessary. Um, yeah. So you can follow me on Instagram. It's the at sign art dot o dot dirt, D-I-R-T. Uh, Facebook, dirt, son of earth. That is I. Um, I am involved with the uh, Slimy Clearing production. Do some art for their videos. Um, so check out their YouTube channel as well. And yeah, hit me up if you have any requests for digital art um, or want to just talk about art theory. I am completely a self-taught artist as well, as a, that may be apparent in my messy style. Um, and I think that's important for, uh, for art as well, you know, to kind of trust some of those instincts that we have. And, but not, not wholesale. Um, push them to trust the instincts and the deepness of what you can produce to challenge yourself and not to rely on what's already been established. Um, so yeah, oh yeah, so that's the big thing I couldn't really fit in. I wanted kind of to get into um, the Zizekian notion of ontological incompleteness. Um, and in Dreaming Dangerously, or whatever that book was called, he, at the end, he talks about how there's a, a plate um, in his, like, uh, that you eat off of. Um, it has a Islamic phrase on it about how you can't change fate, as in you can't change that, that there is a fate, but you can change what 
faith itself is. Mm -hmm. Like that the what you do can actively change the future, and that's what I want to really push people to think about doing. Um, so, but yeah, I kind of really get that into there or explore that more without adding 15 minutes, which we just didn't have time for. Thank you so much. Thank you.